what is going on comic fam it's your boy the bearded comic bro and i am joined by comic creator ibrahim mustafa welcome to the show my friend hey thank you for having me man i appreciate it man i'm excited you are your eisner nominated you are a talent uh through and through i've seen your artwork um you've done covers for marvel dc stuff you have across the board and we're talking about one of your new graphic novels here from uh, i believe it's humanoid right yes sir uh, and we're going to be talking about retroactive a little bit. And But before we jump into the comic, I want to know, how did you get into creating comics? Well, you know, like like a lot of people, I was a big fan of superheroes as a little kid. Uh, I grew up watching the Christopher Reeve Superman movies and, you know, the Batman 66 and all that stuff. And then, of course, you know, I'm a child of the 80s, so Ninja Turtles was how I learned to tell time, frankly, because I was like, it's on at five. I just got to figure out what that means. And we're good, you know? Yep. Um, so I was always, and I loved drawing as a kid too. So I was always drawing those characters. Um, and then, you know, I, I got into the X-Men cartoon and that led me to getting X-Men comics. And, you know, of course I had Superman and Batman comics as a kid. And then I kind of fell away from comics for a long time. Um, you know, I got really into Mortal Kombat when I was like 10. And so I was drawing those characters all the time. And then um you know and and as i got older i got into soccer and so that was my thing and all that stuff and then uh in high school smallville hit the air i think think smallville came on in like 2000 i think that's right about the same time because we're i'm tracking with you right now i'm like okay i was a small (laughs) yeah so so smallville was like kind of reinvigorated my my interest in superman because i was like wait you can do that like that's cool we have like an updated version you know because before it was like Lois and Clark and you know like the effects weren't great and stuff but here they were doing like bullet time he's moving between raindrops and stuff and I was just like you know I was totally taken by that and uh somebody got me a a book called the complete history of Superman and it had a dust jacket on it and on the dust jacket were like old Siegel and Schuster era style like drawings of Superman um if you remove the dust jacket underneath was those same images but as reinterpreted by Alex Ross and when I saw like a realistic version of Superman, I was like, wait, hold up. Like, <laughs> you know, cause you've seen like painted covers and stuff over the years, but you know, when Alex Ross was like doing that stuff, it's just like, like, it's so tangible, you know? Yeah. And I always really loved a believable version of this stuff. Like, so seeing that just sent me down the rabbit hole and I, you know, discovered kingdom come. And then I was just, you know, buying up like, and I was like, oh, this Mark Wade guy's pretty good. And then I, I got Superman Birthright and, and that just sent me down the rabbit hole. And eventually I got in all kinds of genres and, and characters and stuff. And so, um, <clears throat> yeah, then it was kind of like a sort of natural progression to go like, well, I love to draw and I love comics, you know, let me, let me see if I can actually make some and then, you know, down that rabbit hole. So <laughs> that's, that's so good. I love, I love that part of your origin story is Smallville because I, I love that show. It, I think it gets slept on so often now, like people almost put it like, oh, it's one of those CW shows. It's like, man, it changed the game because yeah. they weren't doing what they were doing now. And so I'm just like, when you said Smallville, I'm like my heart fluttered. <laughs> right. Yeah, it's funny because, you know, those shows like, I mean, Smallville really set the precedent for like shows that are like, hey, you like this character? Well, how about before it all happened? And it's mm-hmm. like, well, I mean, I uh, hang on. <laughs> I like the character, you know? and uh you know i think they definitely got to a point where it was like all right just make him superman at this point you're bringing all the villains in and you know um but yeah i mean as far as because you know this was like we didn't have sort of the core characters of marvel and dc in in movies and and films at that point i mean i think spider-man came out in what 2001 yeah it was it was 2000 2001 right in around that same time frame i mean so we we you had your limited you had your you know your you Batman's popping up in the, you know, 89 and then early nineties. And, you know, you had Marvel did a couple with blade and daredevil, but they're really just, we're spoiled now. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. And like, you know, blade, I mean, I love those, those first two movies are incredible. Like, but you know, he's a more of a fringe character. And then, you know, likewise daredevil was kind of, I mean, even Iron Man was a like a second, third tier character. And it wasn't until the movie came out that it just blew up. Right. So. Like, the fact that the fact that Marvel was like, we're gonna start our franchise uh with Iron Man, like that's a bold move. Like he's not even on the cover of like infinitely infinity war. <laughs> he's like yeah. on the back flap because he wasn't a mainstay then. So that's yeah. crazy. 
So how did that then, so how did your love, you know, for comics and Superman and, you know, like you said, Alex Ross, all those, you know, seeing the artwork, um, how did that transition then to say, okay, this is something I want to pursue as a career? I, I, you know, as I got older, cause I, I mean, I was in my, I think I was like 19 or 20 when I started reading comics again, like actually going to the shop and picking them up and stuff. And <clears throat> We had a local, a little local comic book show uh, here in Portland where I live called the the Portland Comic Book Show, and it was like a one day, sometimes two day thing, but it was more of the swap meet style of show. And they would have like you know somebody who appeared on Star Trek in like the eighties or something, you know, or whenever that would have been a thing. Um, <clears throat> and uh, I would go to that, and I kind of realized like, oh, you can just rent a a booth here, like you can just rent a table. So I did that and started trying to sell, you know, drawings and prints and stuff. Um, not quite like into the sequential part of comics yet. Like just okay. going like, hey, I love these characters, you know, I, I and I've, I've been at that point, I had been to Emerald City's Comic Con where it was like, you know, I saw Adam Hughes doing sketches at his table all weekend and being like, how do you do that? I want to do that, <laughs> you know? Right. Um, so just kind of doing my my best sort of like impersonation of that job and then realizing like oh no it's really about like all these people who i like they got their you know they they cut their teeth doing the actual like interiors and covers at the very least you know yeah and usually you don't just get hired to do covers no more so nowadays because you know instagram and twitter is like oh they threw up a cool image of that character let's hire them to do that you know it <laughs> used to be you had to like draw the interiors more, more and all that right. but um so yeah i just kind of followed that path and then um realize like if that's what I really wanted to do I was going to have to actually do comics which was great because I love comics anyway and then so I started finding scripts like in online or in the back of trades you know sometimes they'll do it as like bonus features and stuff um, and I started you know drawing from those scripts and and just listening to podcasts that were about breaking in who would have you know editors or people like C.B. Sobolski on to talk about you know the pathway into comics and that sort of thing and I just kept at it and then eventually, you know, started finding writers to team with, like through online forums. This is back in the forum days, you know. <laughs> right. And then from there, um, I kind of realized, like, you know what, I think I can actually do some of this myself. So I wrote and drew my own like 20 page comic, uh, which, you know, I self published it and sold it at a convention. And that helped me kind of realize like yeah you know that was like my boot camp for it like i can really do this instead of just doing like four or five sample pages like let me just do a whole thing where i'm doing the pacing and all that and, and then uh you know eventually someone online saw my work and was like hey want to hire you to do volume two of our idw book that nobody reads and i was like yeah let's do it <laughs> so i did that and then i met uh my buddy chris sabella and together we did a book called high crimes um that came out through a digital first uh, comicsology imprint called Monkey Brain. Okay. Uh, and so we did that and that's what we actually got nominated for Eisner's for that. And that kind of brought us into the industry and then Dark Horse collected it for us in a hardcover. And eventually now it's actually an image in a, in a, in a trade paperback. Um, but yeah, that was the book that was like sort of the working resume to show the companies like, you know, Hey, we did this under our own steam and it's really good and people liked it. And, you know, you should hire us well so. i mean that that's got to be a good like a good badge of honor to kind of tote around as you're trying to get exposure of your work like hey this is either nominated like oh so, like, man it it 100 put us on the map yeah totally like we were getting you know chris chris had a lot of friends in the industry and i knew some people just because i live in portland and it's such a right. hotbed of creators but you know i didn't know that many people and so that that book really put me on people's radar in a way that I was able to like make friends within the industry and that sort of thing. And so that's why I always tell aspiring creators, like just make your stuff and, you know, like uncompromisingly put it online and, you know, people will come like, you're going to have to do it for free for a while. And that sucks, but yeah, you know, it's kind of the way it works. So. Well, cause I mean, that's so cool to kind of see, like you have this process of, you know, you were doing the art aspect of comics and you're like, well, I can do some of the writing too. And, you know, we're starting to, you know, I got exposed to you through reading, you know, retroactive. And then I went back and read uh count from, uh, from humanoid and those, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you wrote and uh, did the art on both of those, correct? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And then uh, Brad Simpson colored it and 
Hassan Otamano how he did the letters on both. So okay. I got I got my dream team with those guys. I'm trying to trying to keep the band together. You know, I mean, <laughs> yeah, Hassan's lettering is great, and I mean, Brad since uh, you know he's doing coloring for you know stray dogs and what you yeah. know he was across the board. So like you you have a solid team on these books that are yeah I'm very lucky to to get to work with those guys, man. I mean, you know, Haas is one of the most like proliferate uh letters and comics right now and brad is just like a master and like everything i do he just like elevates it and like i feel like i don't even have to say anything to him i just send him the pages and he just knows what to do you know it's awesome <laughs> well let's jump right into uh you know retroactive a little bit let's talk about uh this comic book uh, you know by the time this interview drops it is already available for people to grab so you know what's the kind of the elevator pitch the elevator pitch for it yeah, the elevator pitch is nice and easy on this one. It is James Bond meets Groundhog Day. And yeah, you know, and I should I should mention if, if folks want to see a trailer for it, then go to retroactivecomic.com and I've got a, a link to watch a trailer and a link to, you know, buy it from various online sources. And I'll have that um, link in the description of this video or the podcast if you're listening. So people awesome. can, can go you. check that out as well. Um, yeah, and uh, uh, so yeah, basically it's it's, you know, sort of like, 30 years in the future ish um, time travel is a thing, but it's like a secret government, uh, you know, ability to do it. Right. Like it's not like anybody can just time travel. It's like there's a CIA for time travel and, you know, the five world superpowers of the U S great Britain, Japan, China, and Russia all have these capabilities. So it's, it's kind of a cold war type of vibe in the sense that like, you know, we have this like really powerful weapon and, uh, you know, hostile nation states will use it to go back in time and screw up our history for their benefit. And so the BTA, the Bureau of Temporal Affairs exists to police that, to essentially like, you know, send agents to do like counter intel and counter ops to to stop, you know, Russia from saving JFK or something, right? Um, and uh, the main character is chasing down these anomalies that show up in the time stream, right? Like, if Japan goes back, like the U.S., you know, their allies, they can say, oh, that was Japan. They can see it like a specific signature yeah. tied to that travel. But these anomalies don't have any signature. And so it's like a real mystery as to who or what they are. Um, so Tarek and his his new uh, training r- recruit, Lucia, go back to, you know, try to figure out what's going on. And Tarek essentially gets trapped in a time loop and has to figure out how to escape it in order to stop the bad guys from you know enacting their nefarious plan so it's so it's so good like i i read that and i didn't it didn't even resonate with me i'm like james bond meets groundhog yeah (laughs) that was kind of the impetus of it because i was like i love i'm a huge bond fan i've you know i've done bond comics and um and i love the novels and and the movies and and i just i mean i love espionage in general yeah um you know the mission impossible movies are my jam all that stuff and so Uh, And I love time loop stories as like a subgenre of time travel. And, you know, I've never seen those two mashed up before. Like, you know, we got, we got like kind of military action version of it with, with edge of tomorrow, but uh, you know, actually using it as like a, as a spy organization kind of thing was such a, you know, fertile idea for me. So um, yeah, that's kind of what set me on the path for that. It's well, it's so it's so funny that we're doing this interview now because I literally was just talking with some friends on a stream the other day of like, is a time loop movie? Is it the same thing as a time travel movie? And yeah. they, <laughs> and so now it's like, well, now I got to be talking about Groundhog Day, <laughs> right? Well, you know that's the fun thing about this book too is that it is it's both, right? Like it mm-hmm. has the loop element as part of it, but like the larger thing is the time travel itself, you know, um, and and I. I don't know how well this comes across in a PDF, which is what you would have read right. of it. But, um, you know, I did stuff within the book to, to really make it like unique to the comics format in terms of how, how you interact with it as a reader. I mean, there's literally point, a point in the book where you physically turn the book around in a loop, you know, to read the page. And like, obviously, you know, when you've read all the panels because you yeah. read them all, but like, theoretically you could just keep going in a loop that's how the page is laid out you know um even the cover so so in the book there's like 
you know, we don't have the sort of Sonny and Cher music on the alarm clock type of cue uh, <laughs> at our disposal, right? Like how Groundhog Day starts a new day every day with that, right? So I had to devise some ways to to show that we were in a new day each or a new a new version of the loop, right? Right. So I came up with a a symbol that shows up in the top left corner of each panel that is like a new loop. Um, and then we also do have the sort of waking up in the re repeated day moment as well. So those things kind of work in tandem together. Um, but that that symbol is also on the cover of the book. And the cover is actually like if you turn it or if you follow the direction of that that circle arrow, like you see a separate image, you know. So I, I really you know, I wanted this to to do stuff that only comics could do in right. that way. Well, and I think like it it's enough that it, like it doesn't detract from the comic, right? Like it's not you're not reading the whole book in a you know, turning it upside down every page. It's right. little notes and like the like you said, the subtleness of the cover. And it that's what's so fun about the art form of comics, right? Like you can do certain tactics like that. And you have to you have to be creative. Like you said, you can't have the the music coming on everyone you have to find different ways to like okay well how can i how can i replicate this into a comic form right um which is just so cool so you have this love for the espionage movies and things like that where did this kind of idea resonate you know not resonate where did this idea start for you like well i wanted to do a a, a time loop thing that was actually the 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 impetus of it is i was like how how would i what what would that be about like how would right. i do my version of it and I was initially thinking about how, you know, you could open a story with somebody going that looks pretty mundane and they're going through these actions or maybe something crazy is happening in the background, like a explosion or an accident or some kind of thing. And they're just like nonplussed by it. And then you see them kind of like go through some kind of thing and clock out and you realize like they're just a day player in this like recurring loop somehow. So that was kind of what got me started. And then I was thinking about like, well, how would you make that? Like, what's the logic behind that? How do you, you know? And then that eventually evolved into, you know, well, okay, if it's your job to to like do time travel stuff in general, what what job would that be? And then to me, it's like, well, a spy would be cool because I love that stuff and I've not seen it done, you know? Right. I mean, we certainly had time travel espionage stuff, but not, re I mean, like, like I wrote this before Tenet came out. So when when that movie came out i was like oh no <laughs> go. but luckily you know it wasn't uh they don't really share much dna but you know or something like looper was a big influence on this i love that movie mm. and that's like a crime story with time right. travel you know um so yeah it was just kind of about finding my version of it and 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 you know but starting from that point of like what if it was somebody's job to somehow work within this framework yeah well, and it's it's so cool to see that aspect of like, you know, kind of how this idea, you know, starts and where it starts to go from here. And, you know, the process is along, you know, like you said, like that you had you were writing this and I, you know, before Tenet came out. And so, like, it's a long process to go through. So how did this kind of, you know, we mentioned the all star team that you have working on this book with you. How did this team come about? Was this was this through your connections? Was this through the publisher? Um, so. uh Initially, I met Haas because uh, he runs a, a, a really cool YouTube channel and like a like a comics online magazine called Strip Panel Naked. And he he does like really, really in-depth commentary on the storytelling of comics. Oh, cool. And I had done a, a digital first book uh, some years ago called Jaeger. It's actually coming out in May in print. Uh, it's in it's available through previews right now. Um, the new title is classified colon Jaeger and it's because it's part of a new publishing line that is doing this like classified kind of noir okay. or spy type of line within their yeah. stuff so it's coming out through fair square comics which is okay. um well there i won't get into the the details of how i you know came about being working with them but uh it was through humanoids essentially that um the guy who brought count into i guess i'm doing it fuck it do it go for it <laughs> the guy who yeah the editor, uh, Fabrice Sapolsky, who used to be at Humanoids, he's the one who brought my pitch to Humanoids uh, when he worked there. He has since gone on to do his own uh, publishing imprint called Fair Square Comics. 
and he's putting Jaeger out in a, for the first time in like an official print volume. Oh, sweet. Um, and we have, we have uh, variant covers by Phil Hester and Dennis Calero, which are fantastic. Um, yeah, it's a, basically it's a, it's a World War II, like post-World War II spy story. Again, love espionage. Uh, where a guy is uh, hunting down Nazis and killing them. And he, you know, he was a spy for the allies. He was held in a Nazi prison camp. And, uh, you know, after the war ends, like he's released and the world just kind of moves on. And he's like, nah. <laughs> so he's going around just finding whatever, you know, Nazis he can and taking them out. And then a colleague who used to work with him at, the special operations executive, which was the precursor to MI6, which okay. is where, you know, James Bond and all that. Uh, she comes to him and she's like, Hey, I'm with MI6 now. We know what you're doing. Uh, officially, you shouldn't be doing that. Unofficially, uh, the prime minister wants you to keep it up and we're going to fund it. But um, if you get caught, we'll disavow any knowledge of you, you know, and, and the, the catch is that he's hunting down, you know, she supplies him with a list of, escape Nazis who have fall, uh, filed falsified death certificates. So like they, they claim to be dead to escape persecution, but really like they're alive. So it's like, you can't get in trouble for killing a dead man. So go for it, you know? So then it's kind of his, his journey of like sort of redemption and like, you know, is, is he becoming just like them by hunting them down, you know? And, yeah. Um, anyway. So, Haas had done a video segment on his YouTube channel about that comic and that's what got us acquainted. And then he started to come around as a letterer. And so, you know, it was always on my list to like, Oh, I got to work with him at some point. Uh, so when the opportunity to, to find a letterer for count came about, he was the, he was the one we, we went to. And also, you know, I'm Egyptian, he's uh, Algerian. And so, you know, uh, for us, it's kind of a cool thing to like be, you know, two of the only, two of very few Middle Easterners working in comics, you know, yeah. like to have both our names on the same book is a pretty cool thing. Um, and then Brad was, he's a, we have a lot of mutual friends. Um, Tony Fleece, who did, you know, Stray Dogs with him. Uh, Justin Greenwood, who, you know, uh, Stumptown, Compass from Image, a bunch of stuff. Um and then Ramon Villalobos, they all know Brad from, you know, being California guys. And, yep. and uh, you know, I think Nick Dragata is kind of a, a link between all of them because I think they went to school together. Oh, cool. um, and so Brad and I were like, you know, had the same social circle. And when, when we were looking for a colors for the book, I threw his name in the hat. And, uh, and the editor, Rob Levin, who I worked with, was like, yeah, this guy's stuff is great. And I was like, awesome. And so he hit him up and we've been uh, collaborating ever since. Yeah, I, again, all star team, and it's it it shows in the comic. So, now correct me if I'm wrong. This you have a three uh, series deal or a three issue deal with Humanoid, right? So Count was yeah. one of them, and then Retroactive is this one. So then, assuming there'll be another one eventually, did yep. when you brought the pitch, was it what? Did you have these original ideas first, or did you start with the pitch for Count, saying you have some other ideas that you wanted to, you know, kind of throw out there? I started with the pitch for count and, you know, at the time I was transitioning into being both a writer and artist, right? Cause mm -hmm. you know, this industry is getting a little better now, but there's sort of this misnomer that there's this kind of binary thing where it's like the writer is King and then you work with the artists and whatever. And, and uh, it wasn't until I did Jaeger actually uh, the editor on that was a guy named Jim Gibbons who used to work at dark horse. He was the one who brought high crimes to dark horse in the collected okay. version and then he left Dark Horse to work for this this digital comics app. And so he was reaching out to people, you know, who he had worked with in the past to be like, hey, you know, let me know if you want to pitch something. And so I was like, okay, cool. So like, should I find a writer? And he was like, no, man, you're, you're a storyteller. Just pitch me something. And I was like, you know what? He's right. Like I should, you know. Uh, and so I pitched Jaeger and they went for it. And I was lucky enough to get an Eisner nomination for that one. And so that really helped to kind of like, solidify that you know like okay i can do this not only to myself but like to publishers as well you know it's like because sometimes you know i i think there like i said there's that binary and they may not they may be like i don't know about you doing both because like we work with this writer on this and whatever and so yeah. um i was working and I'll, i'm gonna get candid here i was working on james bond stuff at dynamite and dynamite 
I love James Bond, but Dynamite's a terrible company to work for. Like they they just don't pay you on time. Like they always act like they lost your vouchers or whatever. And so <laughs> I I was like, you know what? I got to invest in myself here because yeah. I can't I can't just be like waiting for a check to come that's late, you know, all the time. So I just kind of was like, all right, pencils down, and I'm gonna I'm gonna work on the pitch for my own thing until that check comes. And so that's what I did. And, uh, you know, I took that time to, to really put together like a solid pitch package for it. Um, and I was getting ready to send it around and I met Fabrice at, uh, Rose city comic-con and they had approached me about drawing some of their like humanoids owned stuff. Uh, and I couldn't schedule wise at the time. And I, but, and I told him, but Hey, but I have something I'd love to pitch you if you're interested. And he was like, yeah, send it to me. So I did. And at the time, Fabrice had brought in Mark Wade to be like, a, I think, an editorial consultant. Okay. And so he read the pitch and was like, you, he, as he told me, you got to sign this yesterday, um, which was incredible. Because like I said, you know, Kingdom Come was like one of the first things. It you know, comes, and, it's coming full circle for you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, he's on my Mount Rushmore of comics, you know. Um, so Mark was instrumental in in getting the book greenlit. And then uh when i was getting ready to wrap it they were like hey you know we'd like to stay in business with you do you have some other stuff you'd want to pitch us and i was like yeah and that was retroactive and so when they uh, approved that pitch they said hey and we actually want to do this as like a three book deal so it'll do it'll be count this one and then your next one um so yeah that's kind of how that came about and i think they were probably like wanted to make sure i could pull it off again you know because I, I, I was as yet sort of untested i had only kind of written a couple things you know i did i did some james bond stuff that i wrote and drew as well yeah um and uh but yeah i think they just wanted to see because you know count for those who are unaware is it is my sort of sci-fi remix of the count of monte cristo which is a classic literature you know such yeah, a good so, story yeah, and it's like a, it's kind of a lofty thing to to presume to be able to like do anything with, you know. And so I think they were kind of like, let's see if this guy can actually pull this shit off, because you know, like maybe there's a little bit of who does he think he is in here? I don't know, but well, uh, well it, it works because I mean, you know, I got I got the preview of Retroactive to read it, and then, you know, prepping for this interview, and I was like, man, this is a really freaking good. I was like, I was like, well, wait, there was another one that they mentioned. They're like, oh, the, I was like, oh, the count. I'm like, I read the pitch. I'm like, count of Monte Cristo sci-fi. I was like, after just reading your last, you know, <laughs> you, this one, I was like, well, I got to go back and read that. And I read it. I'm like, dude, I loved it. It was such a cool take of, I mean, count of Monte Cristo and sci-fi. Like what, the, what do you don't need to sell anything else? <laughs> Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Um, yeah. I love revenge stories. Like that's one of my favorite you know genres is like revenge stuff i love john wick uh you know um a man on fire you know stuff like that right and so i was i was kind of thinking about i was like what you know the count of monte cristo is like the granddaddy of all revenge stories like right. it kind of in a lot of ways was one of the first like fictional revenge sagas right um it, i mean at least one of the early ones and so um you know i just thought like well it's in the public domain and it's like the the original version it's very long it's like 1200 pages it's it's more of a soap opera like a long running soap opera because it came out like serialized in like a newspaper or something uh and so you know i thought like what if you took the broad strokes of it and like remix it put it in a in a new setting you know because i love stuff like that I, you know um what was that one? There was an image book years ago, Peter Panzer Faust, that that reimagined the Peter Pan lore in World War II. Oh. You know, um, there's been a few things like that, and I've I've always loved that kind of remixing. Yeah, well, and I, mean, I had um, I had David Hazan on my show one time who did uh, Nottingham. I don't know if you're familiar. Yeah, Nottingham. Yeah, flip that, like you know, flip that retelling of you know classic stories, and it's it's fun when you do those takes because it their characters or their storylines that we're familiar with already so you kind of have that groundwork laid out for you right. but then it's like okay but now let's let's add this twist and you know and that's it's exactly what you do with the science fiction aspect of it because it it feels like a fresh story while it still feels like something like comforting of like i've read you know i've got this and it, it works yeah, really well 
it's fun with adaptations to see like oh that's what they did here you know or like oh i like the i mean even even something like batman begins right like yep. nolan and company took the very familiar story of batman and you know recontextualized it in like a modern day real world setting and made all of it made sense make sense in a really cool way you know um and so i i love that kind of stuff and that that was a big part of doing count and also you know because it's a well-known thing i knew that it would be easier to sell right as i was trying to get my foot in the door as both a writer and an artist like um you know there's there's more of like a track record for the original story that i could kind of like count on no pun intended for you know <laughs> then to be like oh, okay we know this you know um but then i i you know that was sort of my way to get my foot in the door and then i just completely like aside from the broad strokes of like young guy thrown in prison for a thing he didn't do comes out to get revenge like you know i mean there are, there's androids in this there's like revolution there's you know there's a lot of action because again the original book there was like not a single sword fight in that book like you'd think there would be because the guy who wrote uh three musketeers you know right but um so you know i i really made it feel like a you know like a like a two-hour kind of action movie version of that story i think yeah there's yeah like you said there's a lot of notes of that but it, it is a fresh story that you're telling of and it's action-packed and i highly recommend checking it out so for you as someone who dabbles in writing as well as art like you know you do both you tread the you know line do you have a preference when it comes to comics? And I know I say dabble and it's like, no, you full on do these, but you have your foot <laughs> in both camps here. Right? So you're like, oh, I'll try and write it. Like you're doing both and you do both really well. But is there some, is there one that you gravitate more towards that? Yeah, I, I prefer, well, it's interesting, you know? I mean, if I had to do one or the other, it would be drawing, right? Okay. That's my first love. That's what I really, I mean, at the end of the day too, comics are a visual medium, right? Like that's what, that's what you're consuming, whether you're just, you know, a lot of people think that like they're reading the dialogue and, you know, like that's the story, but like, no, the story is just as much in the art. Right. Um, and a lot of times the art dictates what the dialogue is. A lot of people don't realize that they're like writers will get the pages and then they'll retweak stuff to, to make it fit better. You know, you know, they'll go, Oh, they added a funny sight gag here. Let me put some dialogue on that, you know, and that kind of thing. And then, I'll, 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 you know, the writer gets all the credit for it. That's a big part of why I want to start writing my own stuff too. Cause I was like, I, that was me, you know, like, <laughs> uh, which, you know, in a collaborative medium, you don't mind sharing credit, but at the same time, it's like when the writers are getting all the praise and, you know, th they get jobs based on that stuff that you help with, you know, right? it's kind of like, come on now. Um, but yeah, I mean, doing both is my favorite way to tell stories because, and I, people who have listened to my previous interviews on stuff will probably be tired of hearing me say this but i always use the same analogy it's like it's like uh somebody picking out your clothes for you right it's like somebody going in your closet and going like uh wear this or maybe even their own closet and going wear this shirt and these pants and you're like these don't fit me like i would never wear those colors they don't look good on you know right. i wouldn't wear that on like a job interview or a first date or something um, whereas when you're writing it, you get to pick out the outfit that you feel like looks best on you that, that highlights your attributes the most and hides your flaws the most, you know what I mean? So it's yeah. like, you're putting your best foot forward in a way that is just like only you could do. And it's much more cohesive that way. Like, I don't have to guess at what somebody was trying to think up like a month ago when they wrote this, you know, like it's, I know what I was thinking when I wrote it. So it's just, it's really rewarding to do it that way. Yeah. Well, and I was, I was getting really excited. I was like, man, I would love for someone to just pick out my clothes. But then when you're like, Oh, it doesn't fit right. I was like, ah, oh, dang it. No, like I need uh, someone that like my the clothes fit and then you can pick it up. Like, okay. It saves me a lot of time. You got to just do like the cartoon character wardrobe where it's like, you open the closet and it's just the same thing over and over and over right. again. Like that's the move, man. You don't ever have to think about it. <laughs> well, it's funny. Cause like, I always wear this hat when I'm doing videos. People are like, why do you always wear that hat? I'm like, I like it. <laughs> yeah. It's a cool hat. It's cool. Hat. Like, I like it. it. It works. I don't have to. I don't have to worry about. I know. I always have a black hat. It works. Yeah. Um, but so you, so you have this idea. You know, like you're saying, you're trying to process these, these stories that you're creating of getting to tell what you want to tell. 
do you, have you always had other people do the coloring aspect of it or, or in your earlier works were you doing the coloring parts too when you were doing your art uh a little of both like so that that one i was mentioned that i wrote and drew myself years ago just and self-published and stuff yeah i did i did everything but the lettering on that one and actually ed brisson lettered it because he was a freelance editor or a freelance letterer back then oh, wow. and so i've known ed for you know 10 years at this point because we you know collaborated on that back in the day um and uh yeah then jaeger i i wrote drew and colored myself as well and then nate picos of blambot studios uh lettered it so um i have i have colored my own stuff i color my own covers and you know a lot of times i even just traditionally paint stuff uh but as far as like the actual production of comics um it's it just makes more sense to have somebody else do it because it's such a time consuming thing and and i'm not as skilled at it as i would like to be um to do i mean there if i'm doing it in a certain way like jaeger was a pared down palette and i was really looking at like darwin cook's parker books mm -hmm. for inspiration for that uh, oh i did a superman red and blue story as well that i colored because it was you know oh, red nice. and blue. um but yeah i mean i i can't do what brad does you know so it's like that's where that's where the the um expertise of him comes in and you know just shows everything up so <laughs> so do you i mean because i know you said you've done covers and you know your art do you have kind of like a something where you kind of like inspired you to how your art form kind of developed or was this just something that you crafted throughout the your years of just learning to draw and kind of teaching yourself or was it like watch like looking at stuff like alex ross is you know kingdom come like what were your kind of inspirations for your art uh it's definitely a mix of all of the above like you know alex ross was a huge influence on me early on I, I wanted everything to look realistic you know i was i was into that kind of drawing when i was younger like photorealism type of stuff and then you know as i went on i started to see how you could do something that was realistically believable but didn't look like a photo and you know i think the one of the first times i really got into that was uh, Stuart Eminen's work on Superman Secret Identity. Um, and then, you know, folks like Lanila Yu on Birthright. Uh, and then I just started reading Criminal pretty early on. And I saw what um, Sean Phillips was doing with, you know, and, and I started to realize like, oh, you can let the medium that you're drawing with show through. Like you can see the brush strokes in that, those guys work, uh, but it's still recognizable and believable. And it's not like, uh, you know, cartoony or, or, you know, uh, more symbolic in that way. Like you're, you're, you're still doing a believable anatomically correct person, but there's style to it, you know? So over the years, yeah, just kind of this osmosis of, of, you know, just absorbing all these different in influences. I mean, it's funny, you know, some people will look at my stuff and they'll be like, Oh, I see some so-and-so in your work. And it's like, I don't think I've ever read a comic they've done, but I'll take it. You know, that's awesome. Like, <laughs> like who's that? Oh yeah. 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 sure. <laughs> yeah. And it's usually like older guys who are like, Oh, this is Norm Brayfogle. And I'm like, yeah, man, you know, like for sure. Like, yeah, he's, okay. you know, thank you. Brayfogle was a legend or is a legend, you know? Yeah. It's like, uh, and then when you were like, Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I yeah can now I got to read some Brayfogle stuff and see if they're right. You know, like <laughs> not that I haven't read his stuff, but it's, you know, there's the people, there's the comics you've read. And then there's the stuff that you look at that you're like, this is, I wish I could draw like that, you know, yeah. as someone, as someone who's a big Batman fan, I definitely have <laughs> seen that. Yeah. I mean, it's hard not to, right. He, his stuff is so prolific and yeah. Um, well, I, I hesitate to ask just because of, how much you know you've already got going on in you know in your time here and writing comics and creating comics uh but is there other stuff right now that you're you're working on that you got ideas that you can talk about or stuff coming out that you want to just hit on real quick uh i've got some stuff that's too early to to get into like i just uh last week turned in the script for my third humanoids book oh nice um and then um i'm i'm i've got some other work for higher stuff that i'm supposed to write and draw in the pipeline as well that i'm really excited about because it's a couple characters i really love and i'm getting to put them together in a story oh, cool. um so yeah i mean that's probably a year out still okay um so i you know they'd, they'd probably kill me if i said anything but <laughs> you know um but yeah so i'm i'm keeping busy and then you know i've got more like original stuff that i want to do as well that you know like i've got 
Uh, are you familiar with, with uh, Michael Walsh's Silver Coin book? Yeah, yep, yep, yep. So I have a thing similar to that that I want to do in, in similar in format, like, a, you know, a, a sort of one and done issue each time, but there's okay. a through line that kind of ties it all together. And yeah. So yeah, lots of, you know, I, I hope to keep doing this for a while yet. And then I've, oh, also, actually coming out tomorrow, which will have been in the past when this airs, but. Um, it's a time got, loop. Don't worry about it. Yeah, people exactly, right? <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a Doctor Strange one shot coming out uh, that Ralph Macchio, not not the Karate Kid, but the longtime Marvel editor writer Ralph Macchio wrote, uh, and then I drew it, and then Niraj Menon colored it, um, and it's a uh, it's a really fun, just like one shot story of like kind of a little story out of the past of Doctor Strange dealing with Baron Mordo and the villain Nightmare, and you know, it's a very Ditko esque, you know, Stanley Steve Ditko style strange story. It's pretty fun. Well, it, I I love that you I love that you had the preference like not that Ralph. Macchio. Oh, I mean, because all we, the, I would I do a comic review show with you know some friends, and at one point we were reading like, oh, who wrote that? I was like Ralph Macchio. And they're like, I didn't realize he wrote comic. Well, because you get actors that are getting into writing comics. Yeah. You know, these days you got your Patton Oswalt, you got your you know all these different ones that are starting to get into it. So I was like, no, that's that's not. <laughs> Yeah, and people keep tagging the actor and the Twitter posts about it, and he's probably like, "Ah, this again," you know. Like, <laughs> so. Oh, dang it! See, that's what I just need. I need to have my my Twitter handle be something close to a celebrity, so people accidentally you know tag what? me in my videos. It's, honestly, <laughs> if people thought that that the Karate Kid Ralph Macchio uh, wrote it, we might sell a ton more copies. So maybe I'll just stop dispelling. Just that, stop putting uh, the clarifier out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I have to ask you this, since you know you mentioned Groundhog's Day. And uh, there is, there's a theater in my town that every Groundhog's Day, they do a showing of the Groundhog Day movie. Nice. And it is, they, it's for 24 hours and they will show it on a loop. You can get wow. a, use a restroom. You can eat popcorn, drink, whatever you want. You can't fall asleep. You have to stay up and watch 24 hours of it sitting. And if you complete it, you get uh, free movie passes for a year. Could you do it? No, uh, <laughs> I could not, not because I, you know, I love the movie. Um, I can't sit for that long. No. I can't, I can't be around other people for that long. Uh, I can't stay awake that long. Right. Honestly. That's, that's, I'm like, I, after like the fourth showing of Bill Murray, I'm like, uh, like <laughs> if, if I said yes to that and my wife heard it, she'd be like, dude, you can't stay awake on the couch to watch a movie. What do you think you're going to, you know? <laughs> you can't you can't make it through a 30 minute episode you can't do two, yeah 24 hours that's cool that. though i like that as like a that's a fun little community thing for a theater to do is it yeah. one of like a smaller mom and pop style yep. theater yep that's it's cool. one of the art house ones downtown yeah. uh here and they it's, you know they always show like the indie house films and things like that but it, they're always doing some fun stuff like that like you said for community aspect as well that's cool um well, we talked about your books we talked about everything Ibrahim, thank you so much for just taking some time to talk about comics with me and just sharing about your passion, your love for this, uh, you know, this art form, because it is, it's great to sit down and talk with you about this stuff. Hey, my pleasure, man. Like I said, you know, thank you for having me and sharing your platform and, and, you know, it's always good to talk about comics. Yeah. Well, and it sounds like you got some stuff coming out down the pipeline in a year. So hopefully we'll circle back and find out what that third project is for Humanoid and yeah, that'd be we'll great. have you back on talking about that then. Sounds good, man. So, well, gang, uh, make sure you go out, uh, check out Retroactive. Uh, it's by the time this video drops, it's available in stores. Uh, like it, um, like we said, there's links in the description of this video uh, or the podcast, however you're listening. Uh, go buy it. You're gonna dig it. I, I dig it. Oh, and if so, I can make one more plug, real go quick. for it. Um, I started a YouTube channel recently. Let's uh, go. Where, yes. Yeah, I'll do like you know uh sped up videos of, of paintings and stuff um but i also do custom action figures and so yeah i put a lot of that stuff up there um my most popular video right now is i took a mcfarland the batman figure and like uh customized it to make it look more screen accurate i shortened the arms i put a new cape on him i swapped the head with I, dude so check this out i got a 20 dollar bendy figs the batman figure you know those okay. ones that like yeah, but the head sculpt was way more screen accurate, and it had an incredible cape on it. So I took those pieces, put them on the McFarlane one, repainted them and stuff, and and like it looks way more like the 
like it should now. Um, so I do that kind of stuff. I'm building a Tumblr uh, Batmobile out of like an old fold out play set from Mattel that like folds out to reveal like there's Gotham City play set oh inside, you know? Uh, I'm so going I'm like, I'm going to, A, I'm going to go check this out instantly and I'm just going to be bombarding you with like, oh my goodness, this is so cool. <laughs> oh, thanks, man. Yeah, if you go to my website, uh, IbrahimMustafa.com, uh, there's links at the bottom for my YouTube, Twitter, and Instagram. And that's the best way to follow up with all the dumb stuff I'm doing. So, dude, that's <laughs> like, I didn't even know what you meant when you said custom action figures. And then when you're describing it, I'm like, oh my goodness, that sounds so freaking cool. It's so much fun, man. I, you know, it's like my, my art creative escape now. Cause like with comics, you know, it's my job now. Like drawing became my job. So it's a little, you know, sometimes I want to unwind with something else. And so, yeah, it all started because I wanted a John Wick figure and they didn't have any back then. And so I just took like an old Matrix figure and put him on a, you know, give him a beard and long hair and yes. put him on a different body and stuff. And then it was all downhill from there. So, so you're just, you're, you're just Sid from Toy Story, just a lot better at it than he was. <laughs> yeah. And like, yeah. And I try not to be, uh, you know, like sadistic about it too but <laughs> you know, i always feel bad like when i have this really cool figure and i just like take the head off it to put it on something else you know but i try to use all the parts of the buffalo so you know i yeah. actually have a uh i need to do a little video on this one but i have a phil connor's from groundhog day uh custom figure that i made he's got a little trench coat and the he's got a microphone and a coffee cup and stuff yeah. that's <laughs> I'm, I'm so, I'm so mind mouth. And I'm like, if you see me looking off the side, I'm looking at my, my shelf of action figures. I'm just like, could I do this? <laughs> oh yeah, man. You know, it's, it's easier than like a lot. So when you find the ones that are just like a head swap or something, yeah. it's the best. Cause it's like, oh, that's all I had to do. You know, um, what, what kind of do you, is there a particular line you like to collect? Are you a Marvel legends guy? Or So I am right now, I've been collecting a lot of I'm looking at that shelf. I've got a lot of the McFarlane ones of the DC uh, multiverse. And then I've been going back now. One of my, my childhood uh, show was Batman, the animated series. Nice. So all of all loose Batman figures, but then on my wall now I'm getting them all on board, you know, on the, on, on the card. That, and stuff. Yeah. On card of, yeah. you know, the Batman figures and stuff. So all my loose ones are like, anything from dark Knight, batman the animated series um and then any nostalgic like 90s movie that nobody collects those action figures of like oh how many people have like the full collection of congo i do and oh that's Water awesome like, yeah <laughs> no one half the viewers don't even know about congo or Waterworld Dude. or the hook action figures i have these and like stargate like these that's those a, are my obsession <laughs> yeah that's a great niche because like they're the hunt of them is still fun but yeah. you're not competing with literally everybody who wants like a you know uh jurassic park whatever you know what i mean like oh it, yeah it's it's more off the beaten path that's awesome yeah and and so you'll randomly get like there's some of those like exclusive figures like that nobody was picking them up like um like in hook the the one kid um I'm blanking on his name um uh thun it's like thunderbutt or like it's something ridiculous name. oh yeah uh it's it's like they didn't make very many so it's super rare to find and it's expensive but for the most part i can find characters like oh nobody's buying up characters from you know sequest dsv like i'm like yeah. oh that's me i need that i'm looking up the hook ones right now because i i never even thought about the fact that there was figures for that but i and as soon as you said it i could picture what they looked like and mm -hmm. I was pretty much spot on in terms of like the era that they came out, the style of toy. They're kind of like that Kenner style. Yeah, it's like a Kenner it's a Kenner line type. where uh, Peter Pan does not look like Robin Williams at all. Right, but like, right. But Hook looks looks good. And and then uh, Bob Haskins, I think, was uh, was me. And he, you know, it's a yep. good figure. Do you but, have the last action hero ones? Is that one that you? Uh, I have uh, Jack Slater right across. Uh, right nice. <laughs> Nice. uh so that's when i want to go back and get uh more of uh you know like the kid danny and some of those yeah like those obscure like the shadow you know they made that that gold cadillac uh <sighs> that convertible like el dorado yes. or whatever yeah yes it's it's so good to just see like the 
it's it's a that's a fun niche niche to collect because like you said it, there's very few um you know like a dick tracy action figures all along the shelf so like those are the you know i think it was playmate that made that line yeah um man it's it's fun but that's i don't awesome. know like i couldn't i'd have to get some more realistic figures to do what you're doing <laughs> well you know uh you should do like a youtube video uh series of those just like today we're gonna look at the congo ones i bet that would just blow up man because people love to you know they may not want to go out and search for those but to know right. that they exist and to see what they look like and stuff yeah i bet that, would, I, I bet that you get some clicks i uh i'm gonna have to look into that because right now they're in a they're in a tub all the loose ones of all my action figures as a kid and when my girls come down to the <laughs> to the comic den here they're just like can we play with your toy i'm like yeah go for it so they're That's playing awesome. with we got congo figures playing with american gladiators it's just a complete <laughs> yeah. mix of like doesn't make any sense but it's some fun crossovers <laughs> that's awesome that's really awesome anyway sorry I, you were trying to wrap up i took you on this whole tangent and this was one of my favorite <laughs> tangents to get taken on and like, oh good, good i'm going to go and look at uh i'll have that linked as well in the description go check out this youtube video of the custom figures that's that's awesome i can't wait Thanks, to check man. that out um that's what i like i like finding out stuff because like we almost didn't have this 15 minute conversation about this awesomeness that you do right <laughs> <laughs> well i'm glad i said something it's cool i you know like i said i didn't I didn't even know there were Congo figures, so that's right. There are, and there's my kids use the the monkeys now as as part of their zoo when they're doing the zoo. It doesn't. It's awesome. They're that's really awesome. grotesque monkeys, but they don't. Get... That makes the zoo all the more popular, right? Right. You got to go check it out. <laughs> well, thank you again, um, just for talking with me about comics. And with that being said, gang, go check out the links in this description. And hopefully you can find some time to curl up, grab a book, and nerd out. Peace.